Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 333, featuring the first in a new series of interviews with Mr. Volker Werdick, the creator of Emerald Mine and The Settlers, as well as many other games. In this first part, we talk about Volker's past, how he got into this business, and then uh, we start to get right away, uh, we start to get into Emerald Mine and The Settlers here as well. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Volker Wertick. All right, folks, I am here with the great Volker Wertick. He is the creator of some of the games you probably played if you had an Amiga back in the day. He did Emerald Mines. He did a little game called The Settlers. He's now the creative director at Envision Entertainment. How are you doing today, Volker? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. So I'm in this business now for more than 30 years, and I really enjoy it still. So I think it might be another 30 years until I stop this business. <laughs> yeah, you were telling me before you got your start on the VIC-20? Yeah, exactly. So um, basically, um, I was born in 1969, and um, the first, initially, even before creating games at computers, when, when, when I was born, there were no computers, at least no home computers, and um, so I started creating my first games, which were board games and card games, so around the age of six, seven, and eight, but then um, it, it came to the point that in holidays, I met my first arcade machine. So this was really exciting. So um, I, th I thought creating games on, on such a machine must be really exciting because you can enforce your own rules. It's not that you have to write rules down and people have to adjust to it and there's a lot of limitations of what kind of things you can do, but it's that the machine can, um, you can define those rules and implement them. That was really exciting for me and um, with the Big 20, the first home computer really hit the market, which was interesting. And I bought that one as soon as I could afford it, which was at the age of 12. And um, I initially then started learning basic. So I thought, now it's time to learn coding myself. So basically, it, uh, learning basic wasn't too hard, but just a few months later, I learned that it's fucking slow. So I, <laughs> this really doesn't work to create games. So I did a lot of experiments, and I understood the logic of coding and how things work and better every day, but I really had to learn how this machine really is coded. So um, just when I was uh, still 12, I started learning assembler. And, um, 12 years old and learning assembler, wow. Yeah, really, it's, it's like I'm, I'm not a specialist in many parts of school, so I'm, I'm okay at mathematics, but uh, my real strength is logic. So that was really coming into play here, so it was exactly the direction I had talent. And I'm really bad with the languages, as you hear. So, <laughs> um, well, and um, learning assembler wasn't too hard, but there was not really software where you can, um, there was no assembler software really where you can code and transform um, your, your written assembler code into machine code. So, um, at the age of 13, then I decided that I have to write my own compiler. So, I created a, a strange machine. Um, which was like I transferred something which was somewhat similar to BASIC to um, assembler, to machine language, and um, compiled this myself. And of course, the efficiency wasn't as good as pure assembler, but it was very close to it. So it was still 50 times faster than BASIC. So this was really the major first step for me to um, create a game, a real game. And then I started um, creating my first game at the age of 14. I sold it to Kingsoft in Germany. And um, it was called Time Raiders, and it was a space game where you fly through space, stars um, going by your spaceship, and you try to shoot enemy spaceships. That was for the VIC-20? Yeah, that was for the VIC-20. It's, I think it's really difficult to get this game still. Now, 14 bit... years old. Yeah. That's supposed to be yeah, a record? I, I don't know what the... Uh, <laughs> I, the as I said, I had a lot of talent here, and I stopped really doing anything for school. And um, I, at this time, I didn't care so much for girls, so it was, I still had a lot of time. So basically, I was somewhat sleeping in school and then going home and coding for 12 hours. And, and my parents really got worried a bit, yeah, but... Um, I, I was think, wondering what your parents oh, thought about all this. Were they, were they proud of your accomplishments, or they were more, more anxious about your future? Yeah, I mean, um, I saw this game, I think for, it was for 1,500 German marks. Which is nowadays is like uh, let's say it's like eight hundred dollars about, wow. which was for for my age. Yeah, that was really a lot of money. <laughs> so I really liked it, and um, 
Well, on the VIC-20, um, I continued, but um, soon after that, the C64 came out and hit the market. And um, this was, of course, I, I honestly, for some reason, I'm not sure why I liked the VIC-20 a bit more than the C64. Maybe um, even because, uh, of course, uh, the art, uh, the graphics were better and it had a better sound machine and so on. But overall, it wasn't really a big step. It was quite similar. So I could really um, handle the machine quite fast. But um, I wasn't that excited and I used the next two years mostly to learn more about programming, to get um, more familiar with it and um, get better. And, um, well, just another two years later, when I was 16, then finally the Amiga hit the market. Well, and I can tell you that was really a blast. <laughs> it was like I bought the machine and I, I, I understood I know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it was, again, like it was completely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, just an example. Um, it was a complete miracle that you could load a program wherever into memory where you want and it works. That's not, um, you didn't have any kind of flexible memory management before either. It was, um, it was all fixed, <laughs> yeah. So this was really a complete miracle. I didn't have any idea how this works at all. Or, um, of course, you had the coprocessors, which mean um, you could even um, use, you could write so efficient graphic code, which was completely unbelievable before with uh, something like the C64. Or you have multitasking. By the way, better multitasking than Windows had like 15 years later. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, this was all new things which I had no idea how they work. And it really was like I stopped coding for half a year because I didn't get a clue how this all works. Then I got an interesting, I finally found an interesting book. It wasn't too easy to get it in Germany, which was called Hardware Reference Manual. This was kind of my new Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, when I got this one, I started experimenting and then I got it step by step and learned how everything works on the Amiga and uh, well, this was really the greatest machine. <laughs> and Did you start off with the Amiga 1000? Yeah, I had the Amiga 1000 and um, with some kind of memory expansion, I still know, I think it had 256 kilobytes only originally. Yeah, I think so. Another 256 and later on I think I had some more expansion somehow on it, but uh, yeah, that was, um, it was kind of so the first Amiga I had was this kind of desktop machine. It was not the one where keyboard, uh, it was not the Amiga 500 where it's combined, yeah. I'm a bit outdated here because I didn't uh, do so much Amiga stuff. <laughs> I always liked the 1000, the way you could slide the keyboard under the yeah. main part of the machine. What happened to that design? You know, I'd like to see a computer with that. Yeah, that's true. Well, you made, yeah. uh, Volker, you made one of my favorite Amiga games, so I guess... I'm trying to figure out what age you must have been when you made Emerald Mine. Yeah. And my sister and I would play this game. I don't know, I even know how many hundreds of hours we pl we played that. Yeah, I mean, it was. It is also still a game where I was a lot of was inspired of Boulder Dash. So I thought that's really a nice game, but I can do this much better. <laughs> that was the idea behind it. Boulder Dash still had um, the movement from one field to another, which was instant. So it was really hard to. Um, to see movement and to have a nice visualization. And um, I also thought the amount of elements in the game is very limited. There could be much more and um, more exciting um, elements added to it. So I think um, Border Dash um, uh, Emerald Mine then was released when I was 18. So I worked on it while I was 17 and 18. And um, it's, yeah, it was really, we also created an editor for it, which came out a year later. And, I really enjoyed that game. The original one, all the 81 levels which are inside, I think it's even 100 because of the multiplayer levels, I made myself still. And um, I was working together with a friend on that one also, so and we had a great time doing that. And um, yeah, Kingsoft still, uh, it was also sold to Kingsoft, like my initial first game four years before. And um, they made several sequels. I also helped on, on one or two of the sequels, especially when the um, level editor came out, so that I could um, support the game as well. That one. Yeah, and, and I know there's still this version which is out there today, so there's a, let's say, clone of Emerald Mine um, nowadays for PC, and um, it's really close to the original in many rule aspects as possible. 
Yeah, we were playing it back in the day. I didn't even realize it was based on another game. You're going to learn later about Boulder Dash. Did you uh, have anything? Did you ever get in touch with those Boulder Dash people? Was there any kind of licensing agreement with them? or How did that no, work? Honestly not. It's, it's, I think Emerald Mine is really much different. It's just some basic principles which are taken from Boulder Dash. Yeah, but um, overall, of course, there's a lot of original content in there, so there wasn't really any kind, any kind of agreement. <laughs> in those days, of course, this is all still one man project. So on on uh, Boulder, on on uh, Emerald Mine, I still did, uh, for example, voice and uh, audio myself. So some of the sounds that you hear in the game are even just recorded with microphone. For example, these oh, orange wow. dice which say yum yum yum. Oh this yeah, I love that. Oh, it was Oh, so Oh, yeah, and, yeah, and it was a, the artist for this game still, yeah, so it's, it's like a one-man show for designer, art, codes, QA, and whatever, mostly, of course. There was a friend um, helping me, so I wasn't alone, but, I mean, we did all ourselves, and, uh, but there were no specialists working on it. The only thing which was done externally is basically the uh, title. This was done by someone else. <laughs> I noticed a lot of your games, maybe, maybe all of them, they have a pretty good multiplayer you know, yeah. capability. Is that something that, did you have somebody there that you were playing with as you were making these games? Um, I, I always thought it's a lot of more fun to play a game multiplayer and um, honestly if you create a game like Emerald Mine or later Settlers and you have done let's say 90% of the code anyway so it's not too difficult to get multiplayer in those games if your code is structured well. So what I did there is I always try to implement multiplayer right from the start and make it possible into the games. So um, which is still until now. So I'm I'm now an MMO fan. I enjoy really games where which are massive multiplayer, and we are only creating massive multiplayer games in several years now. And I think that's a real. I'm I'm not really a person for single player experiences. I know a graphic gets better and. Um, the immersion gets better, but um, I, I mean, I think that's that's not my type of game. It's just I'm playing that thing. I noticed with, with a game like Emerald Mine, it's a lot more fun because it's a whole other element of strategy and coordination, right, when you have that other person because <laughs> they could easily kill you Yeah, that's if, you, true. if you don't yeah. communicate. And team up, I, but of course there's a lot of things that can easily go wrong in Emerald Mine, yeah. <laughs> I was looking yeah. at the, some of the reviews of, from uh, back in the day of Emerald Mine, and I found this was an interesting comment of one from a magazine called Happy Computers. Yeah, I know that one. It said uh, this, you know, they really liked the game. Uh, they said this nice little game was produced in Germany, where good games really do not grow on trees. <laughs> so that was 1986. I, I just wondered, what was the game development scene like in Germany in 1986? Yeah, I would say. Um... In, in general, um, German games had um, a, ten, a tendency, let's say, to be too complex, to be fun. So that was an, an issue for many of the games which came out of it. But overall, I think there was no real computer gaming industry uh, in Germany in those days. There were only a few studios or a few teams or a single people doing it as their own. Yeah, it was really, of most of the games, I would say 90% or even more, they're coming from the U.S. and a few from the U.K. And um, that's, this was like 90% of the market, of the development. Yeah. And the Amiga, later on, I did a few um, more games, which are smaller than Emerald Mine. There was Transplant, which was a shooter game in space, um, Alienator, which was like a bit comparable to Defender, but in 3D. And um, Bug Bomber, which was also a, a game which was has similarities with Bomberman. So these were three other games I did, um, but um, they were not as famous as I would mind where I was. And um, but after those three, then I started one day um, to work on Settlers. And that was really the next big project. We need to get your Moby Games profile updated, because I think it only lists after Emerald Mine, it jumps to Bug Bomber. I don't didn't see those other two games you mentioned there. <coughs> oh, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Some of them maybe are not inside there. Um, for for settlers, it was really interesting. I was working. Well, well, hold, hold on one second before we jump to, to settlers. Sure. Like, uh, about Emerald Mine, three. Yes. I'm a little curious about that one because I was reading that that it's uh, made entirely of user levels. Is that true? I'm not sure. <laughs> 
at those days, Kingsoft really published those uh, sequels, and I didn't work on those. I think on on maybe that was the version where the editor was included, which um, then I helped working on. But to be very honest, I didn't even play uh, most of those levels. <laughs> I, I took a look into a few, but um, Kingsoft shipped that themselves. So I was already working, of course, on new games, and then I didn't really look into that. Did you ever play one called Rockford? <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Never played it? Okay, yeah, so let's uh, go on into the Settlers then. So, I guess, how old were you at this point when you started work on Settlers? Uh, let me think. 1993, it was shipped. 1990, 1991. So, it was 22. I was 22 when I started working on Settlers. So, one day, um, then this was the first game with funding. Yeah, all the other stuff I did that was hobby, <laughs> hobby projects. And this was the first game where I was talking to a development studio. In that case, it was Blue Byte, and um, I told them, "Well, I have two ideas." I came to them and showed them one idea, which was um, of a game where you um, travel through a large landscape, which would have been an RPG game type thing. And I had a 3D engine where um, this landscape really looked somewhat stunning, but there was no game content. It was just interesting looking landscape what was possible these days. The second one was that I had an idea of a um, of game where the player can, well, order commands and he has minions and the minions execute his commands but he doesn't control them directly. And I think there's a lot of potential in this idea in general. And the boss of um, Blue Byte those days still listened to both ideas and he said immediately do the second. This sounds interesting. Let's do that one. So we made an agreement, and it was initially planned for 10 months that I work on, on Settlers, and then it's finished. Well, after 10 months, I came back to Dubai and said, okay, yeah, it will be great, but I think I need another time. <laughs> it's, it's a bit bigger than originally planned, but of course, I had a nice version of the game. And they really liked it, and let's say compared to internal productions, the game was still extremely cheap to create. Because it was still in those days a one-man show, and they added one artist to the project. So it was me for, um, let's say, design, code, balancing, and there was one uh, and sound, and there was one artist on the project. So we continued another ten months, and the game was done. And uh, when it was shipped, it was really incredible success. Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't have this kind of big success, success, of course, in the states, but in Europe it was extraordinary. It was like for Blue Bites, they also had the Battle Line series, which is really um, um, a successful game series. And But the Settlers, um, the original part, I think it uh, topped the sales of Battle Line by factor of three or something. So it was for them, it was like it was bigger than everything else it had. And um, they were really happy about the game. So what was it called originally? Because I've seen a couple different names. I always thought it was The Settlers, but I saw it also called Surf City, Life is Feudal. That's true. It's uh, In Europe it was called The Settlers, but um, Dubai was looking for an American partner to publish the game in the US. And they said, uh, their partner, I'm, I'm not even sure, something is P, but I forgot their name. But they said, um, oh, The Settlers, people in the US were not the name they think of uh, Western. <laughs> with, uh, with cowboys and uh, all this stuff, and so we have to name it different. So they decided to give it a different name for the US market, at least for the first part. I think that was changed for the second part, and it all switched. <laughs> but yeah, the first one that was, was named Surf City. And it had fans in the US, it wasn't a big success there, but um, it was a success. Oh my god, I remember when I first loaded that game up on, I don't, I mean, all production. Anything else was put on hold. You know, I had to play this game. I think I pretty much just wore out my Amiga 1000 playing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I really enjoyed creating that game. It's, um, it's, of course, it's also, I would say, the first game I created where I had maybe a bit of inspiration here and there, but it was completely an original title. I was just thinking of that, because your other games like were based on existing games, right? And with, with this one, it seems... Uh, so you said you'd had some board game. You wrote some board games before you got into uh, computer games. Yeah, that's. Did that uh, lead into? Did you use any of that for the settlers? 
Um, no, not really. It was, I would say, if I look at computer games, um, I, I was often asked, I, I took a bit of little inspiration from, I think, games like Populous, mm -hmm. which was out before, but maybe just for the landscape, because um, the, the whole game is a complete, complete different thing. And um, also the game like Little Computer People, where, where units do something automatically. Oh, um, I remember that one. It is something which has some relation to it. Yeah, I knew. Of course, I mean, those days, I basically knew all the games which are out there. So I took, uh, I looked into everything which was out there. And um, if you look for similarities, you can find something here. But overall, I mean, it's a whole new original concept. And yeah, this was really a nice, nice thing. And um, I wasn't really aware of that success and that it's so difficult to produce such, such a success. So I wasn't really so much interested in creating a sequel for Settlers, and um, Blue White did that sequel internally. But um, two years later, um, I came back to Blue White and uh, we discussed um, another sequel. They wanted to do another um, Settlers title, so which was then obviously Settlers 3, mm -hmm. and they discussed it with me if I want to do it, and I said, yeah, I'm definitely interested, but I want to do a lot of changes to the game. So my personal belief is always that um, I, I'm not a fan of sequels which just a bit better graphics. I want to um, to make the gameplay really different and to enhance it and get it to the level. And that's what I tried on the Settler 3. And I think that was also a whole new game experience. Dubai had, didn't have the easiest times those days. They were struggling a bit and we had a lot of pressure on releasing Settler 3 in time. I can remember that was the hardest work time I ever had on, on a game. It was um, for the final four months, um, I'm, I probably lost a few years of my life. Wow. <laughs> it was like uh, I was working in their office, I was um, just um, leaving home because then we could um, speed up some things. And um, I, was also, I was also working together there with Dirk Ringe, we, we still work together nowadays. So he's still in, in our studio here, and um, he's, he's basically running the business here. And um, we were there at Blue Byte, and I worked like 100 to 110 hours a week. It was basically sitting at the computer, and I had my my place to sleep two meters <laughs> next Good to the grief. computer. What? Yeah, sitting four or six, eight hours, and then going back to the keyboard. So we had an um, it had an online component, this multiplayer. So what we did is. Um, we had a first initial alpha version out there, which was really, you could only just build a few buildings in this um, alpha phase. And um, we had, in, within 75 days or so, we made 105 patches. So we had even days with two or three patches at one day, which enhanced the game. So it was really, a, it was like work and Luckily, this phase ended at some time, and Dubai um, was able to ship the game, and it was another great success. I think overall, it um, was more or less the most successful part of the series. Yeah, I had that one too. Of course, it's, I was thinking it was a little bittersweet because it wasn't on the Amiga anymore, right? You had to play it on. Yeah, on I can imagine. <laughs> but it was fun to have. I, I was glad to see a familiar series that I, you know played on the Amiga available for Windows and. I thought it was cool. Also, you had three nations, all those different options, and it's it's pretty uh pretty complex. I mean, you could really get into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I can tell you something interesting about Settlers One. How we did the PC version of Settlers One, or maybe a bit uh, a bit more about Settlers One. What was there? Um, Settlers One is like I I never really coded C those days. I always still wrote assembly. So Settlers 1 war had 70,000 lines of assembler code mm -hmm. and um, there was basically no C code, just a few shell lines around it. So that was kind of a really incredible effective piece of software. Um, those days I remember the game Age of Empires was out there. And Age of Empires it had like each player could have, I'm not sure, 200 units or 100 or something. But if two players had each 100, it was the frame rate was like going down to 10 or even less. So what I was able to do here is um, to really code very efficient and um, in a way that in the end you could have 4,000 settlers on a 7 megahertz machine running around and um, you still had those, uh, well, settlers had 12 frames per second usually or 25 frames per second, it depends. And um, so this was really outstanding for those days. And for the PC, what we did is like, we 
because the assembler code was very efficient. We did a cross compiler. So Settlers uh, 1 wasn't really coded on PC. Instead, it was just transformed and compiled to it, and only the graphic engine part was rewritten. So that was really a uh, very unusual way to develop a new game. <laughs> yeah, I was always really impressed with, with the settlers on the Amiga. And I don't think I was ever able to create a, a big enough world to crash the computer or anything. It was, <laughs> it was huge. Uh, I mean, you could... Yeah. I think uh, with the, I was checking um, the, the hardware, and if you had a faster PC, you could go um, with the larger worlds and up to 64,000 settlers. So that was really a lot, yeah. And um, But I'm sure people tried a lot of things, and at some point it could crash. I know in Settler 3, I can remember maybe another funny story there about the bug hunting, which was really difficult. Because um, we didn't have um, really bug tracing those days where we could step through code and look what's happening. So we only had... Like, we do a change, we compile, and then we put out values and try to find issues. And this um, taught you really to write your code as bug-free as possible, because hunting those bugs was really difficult. And uh, one of the interesting bugs was in Settler 3, we had sometimes desyncs, which means if you have a multiplayer game, one computer is in a different state than another one, and then it goes all wrong, uh, which you still have nowadays in other games, of course. But... Um, those days it was really difficult to hunt the bugs. For example, at some point we had units as a, a knight fighting another knight, but this knight didn't exist on the other machine. So on one computer there was a knight, on the other there wasn't. And then we had a movie stored of the game, and which was la uh, four hours old already. The, the whole movie lasted four hours until it came to the descent. And then we started to replay that movie and search for the spot where data goes different. Then we found out that at some point there's a piece of ore which is brought to a smith, but on the other computer it's not. And then we traced it further back, then we found out that this, this uh, um, building is creating ore, but the other one is not. And then we found, oh, this one has one more fish. The fish is not on the other building because the food was missing. That's the reason now. And then we are already stepping back one hour already <laughs> in this game. And then um, we found out in the end that in some kind of um, water pool, initially there was an, uh, um, um, a difference when values got initialized. And there was one more fish in one field of water initially. And this was fished like one, 90 minutes ago and then finally it led to the descent. But we didn't spot it before because then suddenly when the combat result and some fight was different, then we spotted, okay, there's a descent somewhere. So hunting those bugs was really crazy sometimes. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hope you're having a happy Easter as well if you happen to catch this on the uh, the first day. Otherwise, I still hope you had a happy Easter. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of the show, guys. You are keeping these episodes coming, keeping interviews like this one with Volker coming. So if you like these episodes, if you like that uh, new Matt Chat feeling that you get when you see that new Matt Chat video in the uh, YouTube subscription box, please head over to the Patreon site. Take a couple of minutes and uh, sign up for your buck a show uh, donation on Patreon. It really means a lot to me, and I greatly, greatly appreciate it. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Quite a few news items here. Well, actually, actually only three, so... Uh, let's get this started. Uh, the first one is uh, from good friend Jonas Karat, uh, Karat says. I remember my, uh, when did I interview him? Uh, it's been too long, but uh, as you know, he did the game The Sea Will Claim Everything. Uh, well, that game is now on Steam, but uh, the reason he's on the news is that uh, he's uh, greenlighting the second game in his Land of Dreams series called uh, The Council of Crows. So I'll post a link to that in the show notes if you'd like to support that on uh, Steam Greenlight. Uh, and let's see, Thamer uh, wrote in about this in-depth history of the Amiga by Jeremy Reimer over on Ars Technica. 
And this is a pretty extensive, I think it's something like eight parts, um, eight or nine parts, maybe uh, more coming. Uh, and uh, Thamer says there's quite a few interesting tidbits in there that even, uh, you know, uh, Amiga veterans might have, uh, might be new uh, to them as well. So go check that out. Uh, and then finally, a little bit of personal news. The uh, Vintage Games 2.0 book that I wrote is uh, available for pre-order now. Uh, it's right around $55 on, you can get it either on Amazon, pre-order it, or go directly to the uh, Focal Press site, and I'll post links to that. Uh, some people have been asking me about signed copies. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, let me know. Probably the easiest way to handle that would be to uh, uh, have it sent to my address, and then I can send it to you from there. Uh, so if, if that's, it's, you know, we've got some time here, but if that's something that's uh, interesting to you, let me know, and I'll see what we can set up. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I got another selection from the uh, lovely anonymous folks from Sweden, uh, Maria and Jim. Uh, this is the... <laughs> Why well, even pretend that I can read this? It looks like Arboga. Arboga? Originalit. I assume that would be original. Det Glen Olet Sedan 1365 Smackful Oklasiker. Uh, 5.6%, I assume that's alcohol, so uh, not too bad on that. Some really interesting symbols. I guess these must be patriotic symbols for Sweden on here. It's a pretty cool guy with a helmet there. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't make any of that out. Something here at the bottom about Cerverus Vol Killed Melon 5 to 7th grader. So I guess in Sweden, this beer is appropriate for 5th uh, to 7th graders. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I need to move uh, to Sweden, don't I? Uh, Starkoll, there's that word again. Inhale corn malt. In the holler corn malt. Three towns. Okay, hope that was edifying for you. <laughs> anyway, let's get this. Uh, there's an A. Uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Arboga here in the uh, rather excellent drinking horn. Man, I'm telling you, this smells maybe even better than that one I had last time. You know, it really smells like a good Belgian ale to me. You get this sort of citrusy, sort of wheat-like uh, uh, like scent off of this. I think that someone told me the last one was a lager. In which case, I'll say the Swedish lagers must be very different than the uh, typical American lagers because uh, <laughs> not, not the kind of lagers I'm used to. Anyway, this just smells really, really good, so let's give it a taste. A really good flavor on this one, too. It's kind of a light, uh, crisp flavor. Uh, you can definitely tell this is a little bit stronger than that one I had last time. Uh, what kind of flavors am I getting here? There's that sort of a, a little bit of a malt uh, flavor with this. Kind of like a cereal taste. Well, yeah, I'd say this is pretty solid. A little bit, uh, what, what kind of flavors am I getting here? It's got kind of a little bit of a citrus, kind of a lemon rind uh, like quality to it. It's a little bit of a darker taste as well on the back end there. It's a, uh, all in all, not bad. It's uh, somewhere, I'd say, how to describe this? It, it's, it's flavorful, but not uh, pungent or overpowering. You know, this is something you could probably have with a meal. It wouldn't overpower the taste of your food. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fond of this one. I think I like this one. Uh, maybe a little better than the one last time. Uh, so I'm somewhere between four and five uh, drinking horns on this one. I think I'm going to go uh, four drinking horns on this, but it's pretty close to a five. So I think we're halfway in between there. Uh, anyway, very solid choice here. So thanks again, uh, Maria and Jim, for the Arboga Original, <laughs> original A. <laughs> a very solid choice. I would give it an A as well. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking up for quotes about Easter and eggs. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I have some Easter eggs hidden back here you can look for. Uh, but I, I thought this was a pretty fun quotation. This is from Maria Navrat Tolova. It goes something like this. The difference between involvement and commitment is like ham and eggs. 
the chicken is involved, the pig is committed. <laughs> See you guys next week. Where's the ordinary rabbit? That's the most foul, cruel, and bad-tempered rodent you ever set eyes on!